Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rick Lifton, president of the Rockefeller University, and I'm delighted to welcome you to another of our sessions, Virtual Discussions with Genuine Experts. This is the third in our series of webinars about the pandemic and the work that Rockefeller scientists are doing to combat COVID-19. My thanks to everyone for a remarkable outpouring of generosity and support for the university at this challenging time. We are incredibly grateful. We have a spectacular group of scientists in 20 Rockefeller laboratories here at the, on the university campus who are doing work on COVID-19 in collaboration with colleagues around the world. Today's virtual discussion is with one of those scientists, Charlie Rice, a world-renowned virologist whose work enabled the development of the cure for hepatitis C. Before we hear from Charlie, I want to give you an update on some of what's happened in the pandemic over the last two weeks. So this, uh, just to recap, is the coronavirus uh, structure, a single RNA uh, uh, molecule inside uh, a, an envelope shell. And this shows an update uh, from, this is where we were when we last met two weeks ago. There were three million, this is from the Johns Hopkins website. You can see in the upper left-hand corner that at that time there are 3,775,000 cases and 264 global deaths, 264,000 global deaths. And this is where we stand as of uh, this morning. So since we last met, there have been an additional 1.25 million people infected worldwide and an additional 65,000 deaths. So that today we stand over 5 million cases worldwide and more than 328,000 deaths uh, from this uh, virus. On the left-hand side, you can see country by country uh, starting at the top, the U.S. has almost five times as many cases as any other country uh, in the world. Uh, and, uh, almost, and then on the right-hand side, under global deaths, you can see that uh, we stand, uh, stood this morning at 93,000 uh, deaths, now more than 95,000 deaths. Uh, and that's, again, by far the most uh, in uh, uh, any country worldwide. In the lower right-hand corner, you can see the, uh, on the yellow line uh, the shape of uh, the acquisition of new cases uh, worldwide. And this is go continues to be going up uh, linearly uh, across the globe uh, as an aggregate. Uh, but on an individual country basis, uh, there's a marked variation. And that continues within the United States as well. So in the United States, there's a wide variability the rate of which new cases are being diagnosed. And in the top row, you can see that there are some states, predominantly those in the Northeast of the United States, in which the uh, rate of new case uh, diagnosis is going down significantly. Uh, new York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania, all with uh, descending uh, incidence uh, rates. There are some states, uh, such as in the middle, Illinois, California, Florida, and Maryland, that have a relatively stable uh, rate of new cases. Uh, but there are some states in which new cases are on the rise, including Texas, North Carolina, Minnesota, and Arizona. So this is uh, uh, one pandemic uh, with very many different uh, microclimates. Uh, and uh, each uh, region and state has its own uh, rate of new case acquisition. And you can get even more granular than that. And on the left shown here is uh, recent confirmed cases over the last four weeks. And on the right are recent deaths over the last four weeks. And you can see that the distribution is not, only, uh, is not only varied across the country, but it's varied within states. So for example, uh, you can see that uh, uh, there are regions in which there are foci of uh, uh, high activity of many new uh, cases uh, and many new deaths. <clears throat> Much of these small signals, regions with signals that we see in the Midwest uh, are related to the meatpacking industry that you may have heard about uh, the uh, outbreaks uh, that continue to go on uh, there. And in terms of where the greatest uh, growth in number of cases is occurring, uh, it is uh, in several major cities, including Washington, D.C., Chicago, and Los Angeles, uh, where the rate of growth of uh, new cases and deaths uh, continues to be going up uh, at uh, alarming rates. 
Coming down to the state level in New York, uh, it's, uh, I'm pleased to note that uh, we continue our decline over the last two weeks. So uh, when we met uh, two weeks ago, this shows uh, new hospitalizations for COVID uh, each day. And uh, when we met uh, two weeks ago, we were at uh, about uh, 900 new hospitalizations per day. And this has continued to come down. And today, the number, uh, yesterday's number reported today uh, by the governor uh, is uh, 246 across uh, uh, the entire state of New York, uh, with most of those uh, in New York City. Similarly, the rate uh, of uh, uh, new deaths due to COVID-19 has continued to uh, come down. Uh, and the three-day average across the state of New York uh, is now at uh, 107. Uh, again, down from a peak of uh, nearly 800 uh, at the peak of the pandemic. And in Manhattan, uh, the percent of uh, all uh, tests for the virus uh, continue to come down. Uh, and uh, this is from the uh, state uh, data. Uh, and you can see that uh, 41 days ago, the uh, rate was nearly 50% of all tests were positive. Uh, and uh, now the rate in uh, New York over the last three days, uh, in Manhattan over the last uh, three days, uh, is uh, under 4%. Uh, so this is a, a dramatic improvement uh, in the environment. Uh, I'll point out here that uh, the state has continued to ramp up uh, its testing. Uh, two weeks ago, it was about 17,500 tests per day in the state and about 7,500 in Manhattan. Uh, as of yesterday, it was about 30,000 tests uh, with about 15,000 of those uh, uh, done in Manhattan, uh, um, uh, sorry, in New York City. Uh, most people who have uh, the virus uh, and are infected with the virus do not get tested. Uh, and we know from the development of serologic tests for past infection that uh, there are roughly 20, uh, there are roughly 10 more cases uh, then there are people who have been diagnosed uh, by a viral RNA PCR test. Uh, and this continues to be an issue as we think about uh, trying to do contact tracing when we are only identifying perhaps 10% of all cases. The antibody testing has turned out to be a very useful tool because it not only has enabled uh, the state of New York to assess uh, where the virus has uh, been at a statewide level, uh, in the last uh, uh, week, the state has gotten down to a much more narrow uh, identification of hotspots. Uh, and this, these show results in particular communities uh, and particular zip codes in which it was noted that uh, there were many more uh, cases uh, being hospitalized than from other uh, zip codes. And uh, one of the unifying factors in all of these with high uh, rates of both hospitalization uh, and a positive rate of, uh, a high rate of a positive serology for indicating past infection with the virus, uh, these are uh, overwhelmingly communities of color. Uh, and so for example, in the Bronx, uh, the uh, Morrisania uh, uh, area, has, in contrast to a New York city-wide rate of uh, about 20% of all people tested have been uh, positive for antibodies to the virus, indicating past infection. Uh, in this uh, zip code, 43% of people tested uh, had a positive test. And there are many communities uh, like this where there is a much higher rate of uh, past infection. And that goes along with the rate of new hospitalization per 100,000 uh, people across the city. That rate is about 1.8. But in these communities, uh, the rate is uh, typically between 3 and uh, 5. So when we met uh, two weeks ago, we talked about some emerging clinical observations. Uh, the first of these was the role of vascular disease in young adults uh, that was becoming more apparent. Uh, and uh, there's been an important new wrinkle to this. Next slide in the last two weeks that you may have heard about. Uh, and this is the identification of a previously unrecognized syndrome in children. Uh, it's related to a disease that we knew about previously called Kawasaki syndrome. Uh, and, but this has been given the uh, distinct name pediatric multisystem inflammatory syndrome. 
Uh, it uh, appears to be most commonly now uh, uh, related to uh, past infection uh, with COVID-19. Uh, it typically presents with high fever, more than 101 degrees Fahrenheit, lasting for several days, often associated with abdominal pain, conjunctivitis, muscle aches, uh, and a, a rash that can be evanescent, uh, can, be, uh, can migrate from uh, one part of the body to uh, another, uh, but it tends to be a reddish, violaceous rash. The importance of this syndrome is it can have serious cardiac uh, manifestations. Importantly, uh, if children are identified with this disease, there are a number of therapies that appear to be uh, efficacious in attenuating the syndrome. Uh, and uh, there have been uh, a very small number of deaths uh, in New York City uh, from this. Uh, in New York, there have been over 100 uh, uh, children diagnosed with uh, this uh, uh, previously unrecognized syndrome, uh, but it now has been recognized that it has occurred in other parts of the world uh, as well. A second uh, uh, question that we had uh, posed uh, two weeks ago was whether recovered patients are immune to reinfection, and if so, for how long? Uh, we haven't known the answer to that and still don't. Next slide, please. But uh, over the last two weeks, there have been several new reports of uh, uh, patients who had previously been identified as being positive for the virus, who had symptoms in many cases, who have had repeated negative tests for the virus and now have come back uh, with positive tests again, in some cases with new flu-like uh, illness. Uh, raising the possibility of recurrent infection. We at present don't know how frequently people uh, can be reinfected. We don't even know for sure whether these uh, cases represent new infection uh, or just waxing and waning of the ability to uh, find uh, viral RNA uh, in a sample, uh, but it's uh, certainly something that needs to be closely followed. In some cases, uh, there will be the opportunity to test whether the virus is the same in the first uh, uh, case and in the second. And I think that would be uh, good evidence that they were in fact independent infections if you found that there were distinct uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, strains of virus that uh, were found in the same patient uh, when they uh, were first infected and when they came back with the second infection. So uh, an other, another question that uh, has been important is whether recovered patients have neutralizing antibodies. Next slide, please. And we now have accumulating evidence uh, that the prevalence of neutralizing antibodies is highly variable. Uh, some patients have very high levels. Some patients have completely undetectable levels of neutralizing antibodies. These are antibodies that can prevent uh, uh, infection uh, of new cells when uh, the antibodies bind to the virus and prevent it uh, from entering cells. Uh, so we're learning a lot about uh, the nature of these uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, many of these are to the receptor binding domain of uh, the spike protein, which is uh, uh, the protein by which uh, that binds to the, re the ACE2 receptor on the cell surface. Uh, and uh, there may be others that uh, are involved, but uh, the spike protein uh, receptor binding domain is definitely an important target uh, for neutralizing antibodies. Uh, but the levels are highly variable, which may contribute to this question of whether people can be reinfected uh, with uh, the virus uh, if they don't have uh, neutralizing antibodies. However, in the last uh, two weeks, we've also seen uh, publications coming out showing a robust activation of, uh, the, of T cells in the uh, immune response to uh, infection with the virus, uh, suggesting that these are playing an important role in uh, fighting off an infection. And so even if you don't have neutralizing antibodies, uh, you uh, may indeed uh, be immune to reinfection uh, uh, nonetheless. We've talked about limitations on uh, viral testing and that we don't know the true number of infected people. We don't know the rate of asymptomatic infections. Uh, and if you do have an asymptomatic infection, how infectious are you to uh, other people? And uh, this has indicated that we need uh, much more uh, testing and much more uh, rapid turnaround. So one of the questions is whether uh, we have the best platforms for doing testing today. 
so on the left is the current workhorse uh, for doing the current testing, which is a test uh, featuring quantitative uh, reverse transcription uh, coupled to polymerase chain reaction. And this is a real-time uh, assay uh, that uh, this uh, big machine on the left uh, can do about 3,000 samples per day. Uh, which is not a lot of bang for uh, the buck in terms of uh, uh, what we may need. Uh, many estimates uh, suggest that uh, we need to do uh, at least uh, 2 million, if not uh, more, tests per day in order to be able to both diagnose all symptomatic patients uh, as well as all of their contacts. Uh, and this leaves open the question of uh, whether there uh, are people who are asymptomatic, who frequently are capable of transmitting uh, the virus. In particular, uh, because we have had such limited testing per, to date, uh, we have very little idea of whether children can transmit the virus, uh, uh, are infectious and can transmit the virus uh, to other children and other adults uh, with high frequency. And this obviously plays a critical role as we start thinking about uh, September and the prospect of children <clears throat> going back to school. And we simply don't have enough information uh, about the dynamics of the virus uh, in children. And we need to be both testing uh, children for antibodies, uh, seeing whether their close family members have been infected. Uh, obviously, if you found a lot of children who uh, had the virus, uh, had antibodies to the virus uh, in families in which there were no other uh, siblings or parents who were infected, uh, that would give you some information uh, about uh, how infectious uh, children might be uh, to others. But there are alternatives uh, for testing that uh, could be considered. Uh, and one of these is uh, the use of next generation DNA sequencing. So virtually every major research university uh, in the country, uh, which includes virtually every state uh, uh, institution, uh, university in the country that has uh, a research mission, uh, has one of these uh, high throughput sequencing instruments uh, shown on the right. Uh, and these are two different versions of, a, uh, of an instrument that uh, one is a, low th a relatively low throughput, the other is a relatively high throughput version of the same sequencing technology. Uh, and the low throughput one could, uh, in one day, could analyze about 30,000 samples, and the one on the right uh, could se sequence, do sufficient sequence depth to uh, do about 600,000 tests per day. Uh, so this is in, an installed base uh, that is distributed across the country uh, that uh, with, if some technical hurdles were overcome uh, could in principle uh, really drastically increase the throughput of testing uh, nationally. This of course would require a front end that enabled us to collect uh, samples at this uh, high level uh, 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 required to do comprehensive testing uh, across the population, uh, but it would be very inexpensive at the testing level. Uh, the sequencing itself is almost a rounding error in the cost. It would be about two cents on the, uh, for each uh, 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 sample to be sequenced or less. Uh, once you get to the sequencing stage, most of the cost would be at the front end of collecting the sample and preparing it to go on uh, the DNA sequencer. There are other technologies as well that have uh, the potential for greater point of care uh, applicability. Uh, there, are, there are instruments that are capable of point of care uh, uh, diagnostics now. Uh, they typically can only analyze about four samples an hour, which uh, does not get anywhere close to the throughput necessary to be useful uh, for public health screening, for example. Uh, but nonetheless can be very useful in particular uh, instances and applications uh, in the workplace. Uh, <clears throat> this is a group of uh, 10 of us who uh, got together over the last uh, uh, month or so uh, for a series of discussions about where we might uh, be heading in uh, and trying to identify uh, important unmet uh, questions. This included a group of uh, distinguished virologists, molecular biologists, epidemiologists, and immunologists, 
uh, most of them are properly labeled there with the uh, exception that uh, Peggy Hamburg, uh, second from uh, the left in the second row, uh, has uh, her husband's uh, uh, label on. Uh, Peggy, as you know, was a former FDA, uh, uh, is former FDA uh, commissioner. Uh, with uh, broad experience in public health and a former uh, New York City health commissioner. Uh, so this was, a, this was an article, uh, this ultimately came together as an article that was published in the Atlantic uh, thinking about some of these issues. So um, in the news over the last uh, uh, two weeks has been substantial uh, news on vaccine development. And uh, it's interesting that a number of different approaches are uh, providing interesting uh, data for consideration. Uh, so there are at least three that uh, are out with uh, data that uh, uh, has some degree of uh, uh, depth that provides some evaluation. Uh, one of these is an article that has been published in Science, uh, and this was a, a an inactivated uh, virus that was uh, developed by Sinovac uh, Biotech uh, with Peking Union Medical College. Uh, and uh, they showed that uh, uh, use of this vaccine uh, was capable of inducing uh, neutralizing antibodies in non-human primates. Uh, and uh, this uh, was very good evidence that uh, uh, this uh, uh, vaccine was capable of uh, mounting an immune response in the animals who uh, that were injected uh, with this uh, uh, vaccine candidate. Uh, second, uh, uh, in the bio, there's a bioarchive article uh, on, that has been uh, posted online now from the Oxford uh, group that has developed uh, a, uh, a monkey uh, attenuated monkey adenovirus uh, uh, that has uh, had spliced into it uh, the spike protein from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And uh, they have demonstrated that uh, th this not only can uh, uh, induce an immune response uh, in, um, in mice and monkeys, it's protective in challenge models. Uh, that after vaccination, if you uh, give uh, the virus, administer the live virus to uh, these, uh, individu these individual monkeys uh, or uh, mice, uh, that it confers protection uh, from infection. <clears throat> and this has led to uh, initiation of clinical trials, and now about a thousand people uh, have uh, participated in a phase one trial to get uh, injected with the virus. Uh, with, with this uh, vaccine, and uh, we will know uh, fairly soon uh, what kind of immune response is induced in people uh, with this. And then the third uh, candidate uh, comes from a biotech uh, company called Moderna, and they're taking a novel approach to uh, vaccine, uh, which is rather than uh, having a protein uh, uh, be the target, uh, uh, for the vaccine, they are injecting uh, RNA from the virus uh, embedded in a lipid nanoparticle. So this is not uh, uh, a typical virus uh, like uh, particle. It's simply a, uh, a membrane that encloses uh, RNA molecules. Uh, it gets injected and then uh, enters cells and begins directing the synthesis uh, of viral proteins such as the spike protein. Uh, by which uh, it is hoped to induce an immune response. And so uh, they uh, did not bother trying to get efficacy data in animals and jumped straight to a phase one trial in humans based on past experience with uh, the same vector for other uh, targets, uh, such as other, other viral infectious diseases that they have uh, uh, worked on. Uh, and they reported partial data from the 45 people who uh, received this uh, uh, vaccine and demonstrated that uh, they were able to induce uh, an immune response in uh, uh, at least some of these uh, individuals. Uh, I should mention that there are many other companies that are taking similar uh, or related or in some cases different approaches. Uh, Johnson & Johnson has a similar program to the one uh, being pursued by Oxford in collaboration with AstraZeneca. 
Uh, there are other programs looking at inactivated and live attenuated vaccine models. Uh, Pfizer and uh, biotech company BioNTech uh, has a similar program to Moderna's uh, using uh, messenger RNA uh, approach to uh, vaccination. I think uh, uh, we've learned a few important things from uh, these results, as well as from experiments using convalescent plasma. Uh, convalescent plasma, as you recall, is uh, plasma harvested from patients who have recovered from infection. They give uh, a, a blood sample, the plasma is taken, and then used to be, uh, to be given to a patient with uh, typically with severe uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection to try to uh, help them uh, recover. Uh, in those experiments, as well as these vaccine experiments, we have not seen uh, evidence of uh, antibody-dependent uh, enhancement uh, of uh, a, a disease, which uh, it was a significant concern based on some past experience uh, with uh, uh, the SARS virus uh, and also with other viruses such as dengue fever. Uh, and this is encouraging, not just that uh, you can get an, an immune response that mounts in some cases neutralizing antibodies, uh, but that there do not seem to be major safety uh, uh, flags being raised uh, in common across uh, these three different approaches to vaccination. So this is very encouraging, raises all the questions of how fast could any of these get through clinical trials uh, and uh, how fast could you produce them in the numbers needed uh, to protect uh, the most vulnerable in, uh, the, popula in the global population uh, as we think about the possibility of not just getting through this first wave, but the possibility of a wave coming uh, uh, this fall. Uh, and uh, I think the most optimistic views are by the end of the year, there could be millions of doses, uh, but that surely will not be enough to uh, cover the uh, entire globe. And uh, uh, there are a number of efforts, including uh, some supported uh, by the U.S. government, uh, to begin making uh, these uh, vaccines at scale uh, now uh, in the hope that uh, one or more of them will be successful and we will have doses uh, ready by the end of the year uh, as these come through safety and uh, uh, efficacy trials. So here at Rockefeller, uh, since our last meeting, uh, Michel Nussenzweig has continued his uh, uh, program with Paul Benash, also shown here, of developing neutralizing monoclonal antibodies cloned from uh, convalescent plasma. Uh, these are uh, uh, antibodies that are highly potent in neutralizing the virus. Uh, this has been shown in vitro. The next step is uh, to begin uh, doing this in animal models and then uh, in humans uh, as these antibodies get scaled up uh, to grades that are ready for going into humans and that work uh, is, uh, uh, under, is underway now. Uh, Paul Benash has also made an important contribution in collaboration with the New York Blood Center uh, in, uh, the in the study of convalescent plasma in uh, identifying a serologic test uh, that may help uh, identify which plasmas are more likely to be helpful to patients. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there are uh, the plasma of uh, patients who have recovered from infection is highly variable in the level of neutralizing antibodies uh, that they have. And uh, Paul has been working with the blood center to see if there are specific serologic markers that highly correlate with uh, neutralization. And he has a very uh, high throughput uh, uh, test for neutralizing antibodies uh, that is enabling uh, them to draw these correlations, which look quite promising. That concludes uh, uh, my presentation. And now I want to uh, turn it over to uh, Charlie Rice. So Charlie Rice's work in the area of hepatitis C is a perfect example of how basic science can transform global public health. Hepatitis C is a bloodborne virus that causes ongoing liver damage over many years, often leading to liver failure, liver cancer, and death. The, this infection killed 350,000 people annually until drugs could be developed to combat it. Key to developing these drugs was the ability to do high throughput screens for drugs that inhibited viral replication in liver cells. 
Charlie and his colleagues created a system which allowed, uh, allowed replication of the viral genome in cell culture uh, with a simple high throughput assay uh, for inhibition of replication. This method enabled companies working uh, in this area to identify novel drugs uh, against hepatitis C and led directly to the development of new classes of these drugs which potently inhibit hepatitis C replication in cells and in people. The cure of hepatitis C, which followed directly from Charlie's work, was an incredible advance for the millions of people worldwide who are at risk due to this chronic infection. It's destined to save the lives of millions of people. Charlie's extraordinary contributions have achieved wide recognition. He has received numerous prizes and honors for his research, including election to the National Academy of Sciences of the United States, and in 2016, the extremely prestigious Lasker DeBakey Clinical Medical Research Award. When SARS-CoV-2 came on the scene, Charlie uh, turned his uh, attention to efforts to work on the, this novel coronavirus with a goal of uh, promoting and discovering drugs that will help patients during the present pandemic while developing broad spectrum therapeutics that will also prepare us for future coronavirus outbreaks. He and his colleagues have already identified a human cellular gene that blocks entry into cells by many types of coronaviruses including the virus that causes COVID-19. Charlie's lab is using genome-wide and focused genetic screens, among other methods, to search for additional features of host cells that could be targeted with drugs to inhibit infection. While these studies proceed in Rockefeller's uh, high-level high biosafety lab, Charlie is also developing versatile systems that will enable the study of coronavirus under less stringent uh, uh, safety uh, containment uh, levels. Similar technology, as I've said, was transformative for research on hepatitis C. These user-friendly tools can be shared with investigators around the world. And now it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Charlie. Thank you, Rick. Um, and uh, thank you for that um, fantastic um, sort of overview of where we are in this pandemic. Um, it's really sort of amazing to see the progress that is being made, uh, you know, sort of almost on a a daily basis. So to get right into it so that um, we have time for uh, some few, a few uh, questions and answers. So uh, sort of the title of, of what I'm going to cover here, the race to control COVID-19 innovative strategies to develop drugs. But before we, you know, sort of get into um, the details of what we're doing, I just wanted to give you sort of a, a, a bit of a background and um, really sort of talk first about a little bit of context and uh, personal history in terms of how uh, sort of my, my life as a, as a virologist has, has unfolded. But going back even farther, I, I show this cartoon. And um, this, uh, this shows a, a, a rather uh, emaciated uh, dead skeletal person here knocking on the door of New York City holding a flag that says Yellow Jack. And this goes back to uh, a circulating pandemic that was introduced into the Americas nearly 400 years ago. And for centuries, this sort of erupted in um, disease where people really had sort of no idea as to sort of what the cause of this was. Uh, and this is, this of course, yellow jack here is actually called uh, sort of yellow fever. Now, this problem really um, was kind of a, a milestone in virology. So this is from the, uh, the Harper, uh, Harper's Weekly, published in 1905. And sort of in the early 1900s, it was actually discovered and, and shown that yellow fever was transmitted by a, by a virus, a filterable agent that didn't get trapped in a filter that would trap bacteria. And it was also transmitted by mosquitoes. And um, this just shows you a picture of what was going on in Panama, trying to sort of build a Panama Canal. Um, and uh, sort of Uncle Sam, you know, sort of pointing at this, this impediment, which is, you know, basically sort of yellow fever. And it was really these, these advances that led to sort of the control of mosquitoes and sort of other infections that were going on in the, in the region to actually give rise to Finally, uh, the, the, uh, the finishing of the Panama Canal. So this is a, a, 
a very interesting virus, and it, it has some history here uh, at Rockefeller. Um, so the Rockefeller Foundation actually spent sort of many years uh, studying uh, yellow fever, both in Africa, South America, and, and in the US, uh, with the goal of developing a, a vaccine. And Max Tyler, who worked at the Rockefeller Foundation, and then exactly he, he worked uh, just steps away from where I'm sitting right now, uh, finally developed a, a vaccine for yellow fever by passaging the virus in sort of minced up uh, tissue culture and was able to show that that could protect um, monkeys from virulent yellow fever infection. And in 1951, um, Max won the Nobel Prize for this work. And this vaccine has been in probably a, a half a billion people. Uh, it's, it's one shot, lifelong protection, really quite remarkable. So um, my connection to all this uh, sort of goes back uh, a, a few years for me. Um, when I was a sort of a postdoc at, at Caltech, we got interested in this virus that uh, sort of Max had created and determined the, uh, the sort of genome sequence of yellow fever in 1985. Uh, this actually sort of created, a, a, from other, including other data, a sort of a new family of viruses called the Flaviviridae. And um, so, in this is uh, you know quite a, an interesting uh, coincidence, I guess, if you will. So I began uh, my my independent lab, um, sort of working on yellow fever, uh, sort of shortly after that publication in 1985. And then in 1989, uh, Michael Houghton and his colleagues at Chiron actually discovered this mysterious virus that was the cause of what was then called uh, non-A, non-B uh, post-transfusion hepatitis. It was not due to two viruses that were known, hepatitis B or hepatitis A, but it was due to a new agent that he called hepatitis C virus or HCV. So this uh, somewhat uh, sort of derailed our, 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 our studies on yellow fever, um, which I think we were very interested in doing from a you know, basic science standpoint. And hepatitis C actually turned out to be very similar to sort of other members of this family. So we were confronted with a, basically a new uh, sort of uh, human virus that uh, we could begin to apply some of the knowledge and tools that we gained by studying uh, sort of yellow fever. So um, as, as Rick mentioned, uh, it turns out that uh, the hepatitis C is actually sort of a very widespread disease uh, shown here. The estimates have ranged over the years from uh, 200 million people infected to, to now estimates of 70 million people that are infected with this virus. And the, the sort of take home lesson of you know, basically uh, almost um, 20 years in, uh, or 30 years of effort was the ability to sort of study this virus, develop uh, systems to uh, develop new drugs that have given rise to these sort of remarkable therapies to treat hepatitis C that we have today. And these are often uh, sort of combinations of, of drugs um, and uh, they are effective at eliminating the virus, actually curing chronically infected people. Um, that cover all of the different genotypes of this virus. This virus is incredibly diverse, as are uh, many RNA viruses. So, um, you know, that's you know sort of where we were, um, you know, several years ago. And you know, as a molecular virology lab, uh, we'd sort of done what we had, what we could do. I think in terms of of uh, setting the playing field for drug discovery and. Now it was really in the realm of, of uh, the public health um, mantra to, to really try and figure out how to administer these drugs. So, you know, sort of what was kind of left with, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a case where our interest in hepatitis C was driven to sort of near extinction. So we had to, to sort of make a decision as to whether or not to continue or abandon sort of basic work on this virus that we'd spent, uh, you know, 25 years uh, sort of working on sort of build on this, uh, this hepatitis C work, but diversify, maybe switch to other viruses, or consider an alternative career, which at that point probably was a little bit late for me. Um, but I guess, you know, one thing that there's true about viruses is that, that, uh, is that you know, you just never know what's coming next. 
And um, I actually created this slide um, in, um, I guess about four years ago for a Rockefeller Board of Trustees meeting. And it was at a time when you sort of, you never know what's coming next. And we were in the middle of the sort of outbreaks of Zika virus in, uh, in South America that had spread to the Caribbean and sort of licked at the shores of, uh, of the United States. And um, as we now know, um, this was just sort of one of a succession of, uh, of viral outbreaks, and many of them here are shown in this slide. And um, the coronaviruses uh, really have, have emerged as, as being able to sort of cross species um, with the first uh, sort of example of SARS-CoV-1. Uh, then some years later, uh, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, MERS, and then um, uh, in, in uh, late last year and in January, SARS coronavirus too. So um, really there's, there's uh, sort of no resting on your laurels if you're a virologist because there's always uh, sort of more to do. So um, we got interested in coronaviruses um, actually a couple of years ago. And, and part of the, the, the sort of driving force for that was trying to understand uh, nature's remarkable antiviral defenses. I think many of you know that we're being constantly bombarded by uh, viruses, and yet um, most of us don't get sick. Some of us get sort of mild illness, illnesses, we get over it. And uh, I think for any of those of you that tuned in to John Laurent Casanova's uh, talk a couple of weeks ago, you know that if genes that are responsible for these antiviral defenses are defective, that there can really be you know, very severe uh, sort of outcomes of infections that are normally sort of manageable and uh, sort of benign in, uh, in most people. So um, one of these remarkable antiviral defense systems is the interferon system. And you've probably heard of interferon because it's, it's been used for treatment uh, of a lot of uh, infectious diseases, including uh, sort of the early days of hepatitis C treatment and also hepatitis B treatment. And it's a molecule that is made um, in response to infection, which is secreted from cells, binds to a receptor, and then it turns on um, literally hundreds of, of genes. And uh, we became interested some years ago, and this is work that we also did with uh, sort of Paul Binash, in trying to understand more about what these interferon stimulated genes were doing. In other words, which of these might have a specific uh, role in preventing a certain virus infection. So we were contacted a few years ago by uh, Stephanie Fielander and uh, Volker Thiel that were interested in, in trying to sort of understand uh, sort of how the system might be interacting with coronaviruses. And so the way this is done is to sort of uh, express each one of these genes individually and then sort of ask if that sort of inhibits the ability of a virus to infect and replicate in that cell. And we did that for the sort of common cold coronavirus 229E. And if you look at this, this is two of these screens. Most of these uh, genes when expressed, you know, sort of had no effect uh, sort of on the ability of this virus to sort of replicate and infect cells. But one of them called Ly6E, which is shown here with this sort of red dot in the corner, um, was a very potent inhibitor of uh, 229E as well as SARS-CoV-1 uh, and MERS. And so we were um, working on the sort of mechanism of this together with a, a group at UT Southwestern trying to understand how this might be able to sort of block virus infection and replication. And uh, there's still more work to do here, but one of the things that we believe is going on is that when Ly6E is expressed, it actually sort of inhibits the ability of this envelope that sort of surrounds the virus particle to fuse with the cellular membranes that are needed to sort of deliver the virus's uh, genetic material into, this, into the cell. And if that doesn't happen, uh, replication doesn't initiate. So in January, we were getting this paper sort of ready to, ready to go and write up. And uh, lo and behold, we have this sort of new coronavirus, you know, SARS-CoV-2. 
And um, so we sort of tested SARS-CoV-2 using a, a variety of different techniques. And it turns out that Ly6E also sort of inhibits uh, the ability of Ly6E um, to uh, sort of infect cells. So this is kind of a cellular function that is able to block um, infection by a number of different coronaviruses. And what we're doing now is to actually try and understand more about this sort of mechanistically to, to try and figure out how Ly6E can actually exert this potent antiviral effect. How does it lead to a block in membrane fusion? And, and can we actually use that knowledge to sort of identify an Achilles heel of the virus that would sort of allow us to sort of mimic uh, sort of what Ly6E is doing or find ways to selectively induce um, this particular interferon stimulated genes to protect people. So um, the other thing that I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about today, and, and I think this is, you know, it's obvious to sort of us virologists, but maybe, you know, something that people don't think about uh, sort of every day. And that is that, you know, the, the virus particle that, that uh, Rick showed you at the beginning of his talk, and the one which I show at the, at the top of this is, is really pretty helpless. You know, it's got the spikes that can bind to receptors. Uh, it's got the genome inside. It's got a number of other components. But, you know, without a lot of help, it just can't do anything. And so it, it's really uh, got a very limited um, suite of, of information that it can uh, take with it. And it depends very heavily then on the host cell, uh, a susceptible cell, and in the case of these, the SARS coronavirus 2, these are airway um, cells, uh, to actually sort of initiate and sort of complete the life cycle. So when a virus, you know, sort of binds to and infects a susceptible cell, uh, it sends off, you know, sort of a bunch of alarms in those cells that, that, uh, that really can, can secrete molecules that recruit uh, white blood cells or other cells of the immune system to the site. Uh, it also produces cytokines like interferon, which I mentioned before, which then get secreted and have the ability to sort of protect uh, sort of nearby cells. And then, of course, these cells also are factories for making more virus. So um, it's estimated in the, for this virus that an infected cell produces on the average of about 1,000 uh, infectious virus particles. So even a single infected cell amplifies the infection quite a bit. So it's really this, this sort of infection inflammation process um, that involves virus spread, infection, as I showed you, and, and inflammation that uh, gives rise to sort of the, the clinical disease, uh, COVID-19, that we're all now uh, very familiar with. So what do we need to combat COVID-19? So I think there are um, directions, which uh, sort of Rick has alluded to. One of them is, is developing a vaccine. Um, there's a lot of activity in this area, as, as Rick highlighted. Um, I think this is, uh, is going to be very important because you know there are still a lot of susceptible people. Um, as you heard in New York, um, probably the sort of average rate of uh, sort of infection with this virus is, is about, about 20%, but we still don't know if that's going to be protective and it, it may well not be at least completely protective and we don't know how long that's gonna last. So really developing a vaccine I think is, is getting the kind of priority that it should. The other options are to develop antiviral drugs, a la, you know, sort of what was done for, for hepatitis C, and, and those come in a couple of different flavors. Um, chemicals, as you, these are sort of small chemical entities, or antibodies, as, you, as you've heard about again from Rick, that uh, are being developed by a number of groups, including uh, Michelle Nussenzweig and, and Paul Binoch. So um, in terms of, of drugs, um, when you think about these, they, it would be nice to have ones that have, you know, sort of desirable properties. And I just listed a few of these. You'd like them to be, you know, potent um, uh, and effective. You'd like them to be safe with a uh, few side effects, uh, hopefully, you know, relatively easily administered. Um, a high resistance barrier. And this is important because often if you take sort of a single antiviral drug and try and eliminate or control a virus with that, 
these viruses have a lot of variation. And so there can be variants or mutants in the population that can sort of resist um, just sort of one targeted drug. And so the solution to that for, in many cases, has been to sort of put together uh, an antiviral cocktail. And then, uh, of course, uh, as for vaccines, uh, if you really want to be able to, to uh, sort of employ these in sort of treatment and prevention, you need to be able to sort of scale them and, and, and create uh, many doses and, and uh, ideally sort of keep the cost down so it can be useful uh, globally. So uh, in terms of developing drugs, what are the, what are the useful targets? Um, and there are sort of a, a couple of ways to go. One of them is the virus. Uh, the virus itself and the machinery that its genome encodes. And um, the coronaviruses actually have a sort of a rich collection of, of uh, sort of viral targets to go after. And uh, many of those are being pursued now like viral protease and the viral uh, RNA replication polymerase machine. Another possibility is the host. And as I mentioned sort of earlier, um, these viruses are completely dependent upon uh, cellular factors in order to replicate. So um, that's sort of one of the, uh, the um, things that I want to talk a little bit about today. So I just wanted to highlight uh, sort of in the short time that we have a few of our ongoing efforts uh, sort of in the, in the, in the COVID-19 space. One of them that again Rick alluded to was the sort of develop development of safe and wild, widely deployable screening platforms or, or RNA replicons. Uh, we'd also like to do um, screens to identify uh, druggable human cellular factors that are actually required for SARS-CoV-2 replication and hopefully ones that might be sort of extendable to uh, other coronaviruses as well. And then uh, one of our other sort of current activities is providing some support for Michelle and Paul's neutralizing antibody efforts to test some of the antibodies that they're developing on uh, sort of the, the real virus. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that today because I think you've heard about a lot of that in, in progress. So um, what about um, going after sort of trying to identify um, cellular factors that are required by the virus in order for it to replicate? So we're really fortunate um, because there's a new technology, which I think many of you have probably heard about, called CRISPR. Uh, this is sort of um, a system in, that bacteria use to sort of recognize invading uh, sort of phage and plasmids and, and kill them, but it's actually been adopted. Uh, so it can actually be used as a tool for gene editing. Um, Luciano Marafini is a, is, a, is a pioneer in this area. And what it allows us to do is, in a very targeted way, selectively knock out uh, specific genes in the human genome. And you can do this one at a time, or you can actually do this across the entire genome. And so it allows you then to sort of make either individual cells or uh, mixtures of cells uh, that have different genes knocked out, and then basically uh, infect those with the virus. And this is uh, under many circumstances, this virus can actually infect and kill cells. So if you look at the cells that actually survive and, and basically figure out uh, what they've knocked out, that tells you a, a factor that is important for keeping the virus from uh, infecting and, and or infecting and killing the cell. And what we hope to do with that approach is to sort of identify um, druggable human targets. Uh, in other words, human genes that the virus needs that uh, either we already have FDA-approved FDA drugs, or there are sort of drugs in the pipeline that might be sort of directed against those uh, sort of human targets. I mean, one reason that we're sort of excited about this and the strategy that we're taking is to ask if, you know, perhaps by finding a cellular gene or a cellular pathway that's required by multiple coronaviruses, we would have identified basically, again, another Achilles heel that would allow us to develop drugs that would actually be uh, useful against uh, a whole collection of these different viruses. So right now on this sort of lower right that I just sort of highlighted here is, is a very abbreviated uh, phylogenetic tree for the coronaviruses. Um, there are many, many, many of these viruses uh, out there in nature, kind of a scary prospect. 
but uh, sort of the three at the top are uh, sort of the, uh, the sort of common cold viruses, and then you have SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, and uh, also MERS. And what we're doing is to sort of conduct sort of parallel screens for each of these viruses, to, and then use sort of a funnel to focus on cellular genes and pathways that are required not just for one of them, uh, but for all of them. And the hope there would be that when the sort of inevitable next uh, sort of coronavirus arrives uh, from, from wherever it happens to come, that we'll actually have, uh, you know, sort of candidate drugs. Uh, maybe it would be good to take these into even sort of phase one safety that would actually have the potential to be used even for a new sort of emerging coronavirus to sort of control it before it turns into an epidemic or, or a pandemic. So the other one is um, a discussion of sort of the safe and widely deployable screening platforms or RNA replicas. And, um, you know, this is a virus that's actually challenging to work with um, for a number of reasons. I mean, it's, it's nice that we actually do have a virus that we can grow in the lab and work with. Um, but part of that has to do with, you know, this is a human pathogen. And, um, you know, you don't really want to get infected with it. So there are various levels of biosafety levels, BSLs, uh, that are uh, at, you know, basically higher and higher levels, uh, sort of depending upon the, the agent and, and uh, its virulence and, and the challenges of containing it. And uh, SARS-CoV-2 falls into this biosafety level three category. And um, that's a, a category that actually requires a fair bit of, of, of preparation. You need to have sort of a specially designed uh, sort of facility. Uh, I mean, we have those uh, sort of at Rockefeller. But it also means, and this is a, a picture of Heinrich and Inna, a sort of two of our uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, team um, sort of dressed up in the personal protective equipment, which everybody now knows, PPEs, that uh, sort of we use to sort of work in these facilities. And while these, 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 the, this, this sort of uh, looks like it might be fun, actually spending hours in the facility working in hoods and, and wearing this stuff is actually quite challenging. Uh, and not every institution is lucky enough to have a, a good sort of biosafety level uh, three uh, capability. And on top of that, actually, you know, sort of when you're trying to develop uh, small molecules that might inhibit a virus, there's often we have to do really large scale chemical screens. And that involves, as you can see here, the sort of robotic uh, sort of fluidic devices that are, you know, sort of dropping droplets of, of, of compound or virus into uh, multi-well plates like this. Um, actually setting this up in a BSL-3 facility is actually quite challenging. And um, so there's, there is a desire to be able to do this on a smaller scale. So um, one of the ways that we do that is to actually modify the virus. So that if, if this is the sort of coronavirus genome that you're looking at here, and what's uh, been denoted here are the various proteins that the virus makes in sort of different boxes and shaded colors. This is a biosafety level three pathogen. And, and if you sort of think about uh, sort of this virus by analogy with with, with a car, it, it basically has everything you need. It's got sort of the engine to replicate the genome, and it's basically got, you know, sort of the, the seats, the, the body, the wheels, um, to sort of make a virus particle so that that can be released from cells and infect new cells. Um, so what a replicon is, is really trying to sort of strip this down. So if you sort of took the car, and you took away the body, uh, the seats and the wheels and just sort of left the engine. I mean, there's still a lot of moving parts there. Um, a lot of things that an engine, you know, might need in order to function to probe. And that's exactly what we do in these replicons is to basically take out the uh, sort of genes from the virus that are basically like the proteins that it needs to form virus particles or other accessory proteins and create sort of this non-infectious uh, RNA replication machine that can be sort of housed in cells and then used at uh, sort of low containment levels. So um, that's what we're in the process of doing uh, using a number of different strategies. 
And so I just want to wrap up uh, sort of quickly here. Um, so one of the goals, as I mentioned, is to sort of understand and exploit nature's antiviral defense mechanisms. I gave you an example of that with uh, sort of the Ly6E. I'm sure there are sort of more lessons to be learned from nature uh, to identify uh, critical human cellular factors. And, and we hope that by doing that, we can identify genes and pathways that could be targeted uh, to give us sort of broad spectrum potential. And then uh, sort of create and disseminate the cell-based replicon assay to expand the scope and speed of drug discovery efforts. So um, just a few sort of uh, concluding remarks in the, on this pandemic. I think it's, it's changing the way that science is done. And I think science has really stepped up to the plate and the, and the research in this area is really moving at, at warp speed. Uh, the dissemination of research findings is occurring in almost real time. So that really sort of, uh, again, sort of speeds things up. Uh, it's sort of changing the way that things are disseminated and published. And there's great uh, sort of national and international collaboration and exchange of material. So I am very confident that we are going to have a vaccine, likely more than one, and will be developed in record time. Uh, the, the sort of time scales that people are talking about maybe seem like a long time, but relative to traditional vaccine development, this is amazing. Uh, virus neutralizing antibodies are going to enter the, the uh, sort of clinic soon, so we'll know uh, sort of how those work uh, very soon. And I think that highly effective antivirals will be developed, and some of those will target the virus, and some of those will target the host. But uh, I hope some of them will be useful not only for controlling uh, COVID-19, but also be useful for uh, controlling uh, sort of new emerging coronaviruses in the future. So I think, you know, I have this question, can these efforts help us be ready for the next emerging infections? I think they can. I think they're, they're teaching us, you know, sort of how we can have really sort of a global response. There are some things that uh, obviously have to be done differently and could be done better. Uh, but I think this has been and is being a, a marvelous uh, educational uh, process. So I want to end with uh, sort of showing you the group. Uh, so this is what we looked like uh, sort of back in November uh, outside of the Rockefeller Hospital. Uh, there's uh, no distancing needed here. Uh, sort of reclining in the front, uh, in the foreground is one of our Australian shepherds, Bruno. And uh, just behind him is, is Lily, uh, who uh, often uh, sort of visits the lab under, under better circumstances. And then this next picture is actually our uh, sort of COVID group. Um, this is a, a, a shot of everybody on one of our uh, sort of bi-weekly Zoom calls. I'd like to sort of point out in the middle, Bill Schneider, who's really uh, sort of helped uh, sort of putting this talk together and is also just uh, a force in the lab. And we, we've not been uh, sort of pursuing these directions by ourselves. I've mentioned uh, some of the other things that we've been doing in the talk, but we're also collaborating with J.T. Poirier, who's actually in the upper right-hand uh, sort of square with the uh, face mask on from NYU, uh, the, the low lab at uh, MSKCC, and uh, Dave Allison's lab here at Rockefeller. And actually, sort of the two postdocs from the uh, Allison low lab are shown here, uh, Yadira and Francisco, uh, along with Janito, uh, they're sort of, uh, their son, and what they're doing here is actually sort of squealing a few supplies um, from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, which was shut down to the lab at Rockefeller so that those could be used for some of these screening efforts. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, sort of Volker Thiel, um, who's a, a fantastic um, coronavirologist at the IVI in Bern. Uh, he has sort of a, been our collaborator on the uh, sort of Replicon work, uh, really sort of a terrific guy. Um, so again, an example of uh, sort of global interactions that are going on. And uh, of course, I'd, I'd like to thank very much our, our funders. Um, first of all, um, Maurice and Karine Greenberg and the Star Foundation. Um, the Greenbergs and uh, sort of Florence Davis were responsible for actually bringing me uh, sort of here to Rockefeller, um, where we could establish a, initially a center to study hepatitis C. Uh, hopefully that uh, the work that was done there um, is uh, uh, something that they feel is a good investment. Um, the uh, Robertson Therapeutic Development Fund, 
uh, more recently, the sort of Mathers uh, Charitable Foundation that is supporting uh, the COVID-19 work along with the Baud Foundation, which has been uh, a supporter of the Rice Lab for, for many, many years. Mass grants, a quick mechanism to actually take a sort of philanthropic donations that get pooled into a pot and then try and sort of disseminate them quickly to sort of project areas that have value. And then of course, NIH in particular, uh, the National Institutes of Allergy and Infection Disease. So I'm sorry if I went a bit too long, but I will uh, now uh, stop sharing my screen and maybe we can have some questions and answers. Terrific. Thank you so much, Charlie. That was wonderful. So uh, we have a number of uh, questions. Thank you for sending in questions uh, before the talk and uh, for your continued uh, uh, entering questions on the, under the Q&A button. So um, one key question for uh, any antiviral, particularly one that's an acute respiratory uh, <laughs> viral virus, is how early do you have to treat patients in order to have efficacy? And I know there may not be a precise answer, but what do we know by analogy to others? Well, I think it, it, it is a great question, and uh, it, it's gonna sort of it is going to depend on the sort of molecule, how it works, and how effective it is. Um, I guess my sort of, my blanket statement on that is earlier is always better, <laughs> but of course, you know, there's sort of this window between uh, sort of getting infected, being not diagnosed, uh, you know, deciding that, you know, you're really feeling sick enough to, to go and, and uh, to, the, to the hospital or whatever, and then actually start taking the drug. And um, so that, that is a challenge, I think, for developing antiviral drugs against um, respiratory viruses or other kinds of sort of acute and sort of viral infections. It, it comes up with, you know, flaviviruses like dengue as well. But I think, you know, earlier is definitely better. Um, you know, I guess we're seeing some, some indications maybe in that direction with remdesivir. Um, but, um, but I think, you know, that, that is sort of one of the, um, areas that uh, that needs to be explored in, in, a, in, a, in a clinical venue. And, and in the case of remdesivir, it is to some extent being explored. But I guess the other, the other response to that would be, you know, the possibility of if they're safe enough and effective enough and they're sort of designed in a, in a sort of a long acting, you know, formulation or one pill a day, um, you could, you know, sort of take these prophylactically um, you know, if you were in a high risk uh, situation or a contact with somebody who's infected. Yeah, I think uh, that point is really critical and it couples to our testing paradigm where up to now, we've told people, well, if you've got a flu-like illness, stay in bed, don't come in, don't seek testing and only come to the hospital to get tested uh, uh, if you're really sick uh, and need to be hospitalized. And it may be the case uh, that we're making it least likely that uh, antiviral drugs are going to have efficacy until we change the testing paradigm. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. And I think you, you brought this up towards the end of your summary of sort of where we are on, on testing. And, you know, the, I mean, obviously having a reliable, you know, sort of home uh, test, uh, you know, would be very valuable um, in this circumstance. Yeah, there is uh, work being done to uh, develop home testing, uh, and I think uh, I, either home testing or collect your sample at home, send it in, and get a, a test done by mail-in uh, are potential ways to uh, try to uh, circumvent some of the standing problems right now. But it would be great if we just had one that, you know, sort of you could get it at the pharmacy, have it at home, and... Uh... If you, if you started feeling off or if there was a situation where you were going to go be visiting somebody who was immunocompromised or whatever, you could just test yourself and know in 15 minutes. Yep, exactly. So a uh, number of questions uh, about uh, Moderna A vaccine, and they include questions of What's the likelihood that an RNA vaccine is uh, going to be successful? Are there barriers to success and how impressed should we be with the data that's been released so far? 
Well, I think it is a new vaccine paradigm. Uh, I'm, I'm personally, you know, very excited about it um, because it's, it's actually simple um, in terms of concept. And I think it is, you know, a fairly scalable um, sort of vaccine technology. Um, but it is, it is unproven in humans. And, um, you know, besides the platform itself, which I think is exciting, there's also often some learning in the vaccine space about, you know, what exactly the right antigen is that you want to be either delivering or sort of expressing using this mRNA vaccine. So um, I think that, you know, we're, we're going to find out. And I think that's one of the exciting things um, in the sort of vaccine development activities that are ongoing now. We've got a number of different, you know, sort of classic vaccines that are, you know, sort of inactivated uh, you know, virus. We've got, you know, different kinds of viral vectors. We've got the sort of mRNA vaccines of, of the Moderna type. So I think it's, it's, it's really going to be fascinating to see how these work. And I'm actually, you know, people are, I think, often a little pessimistic when they sort of take the natural history of the virus infection and the immune response as an indication of how a vaccine is likely to work or not work. Um, now, I think from, from what you mentioned um, and sort of what we know about uh, some of these coronavirus infections is that, yes, you, you do get natural immunity, but in some cases it may actually be somewhat short-lived. You can be, you know, sort of reinfected. And you could say, oh no, well, what if, what if the vaccines are the same way and, you know, they, they protect me for a week or two or a month and then, you know, I either need to be boosted or, you know, it goes away. So I think that's going to be a key thing to look at in terms of how the, immune resp the vaccine induced immune response, uh, sort of really how protective it is and how, how long it holds up. But I think it may, we may be able to do better than the natural virus infection. Do you have expectations based on the history with other coronaviruses that uh, natural immunity may not be very long lasting? Yeah, I think for the sort of common cold virus, people have actually, you know, sort of probed this, uh, you know, sort of either in, in sort of a, a surveillance type uh, sort of study uh, or actually in, you know, sort of human challenge studies. And um, yeah, you know, reinfection can occur. Uh, and that, that may be you know, part of the, the secret of success of these viruses um, is that, you know, sort of they, they get into the sort of oral pharynx uh, sort of region and, and start replicating. Most of the virus is in a position to get spewed out, you know, maybe rather than provoking, you know, sort of a high level sort of immune response, because there's actually very little of the virus in blood. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, probably, I mean, a SARS-CoV-2 is like the, uh, the viruses that, that circulate regularly. Um, it may well be that the sort of natural immunity is not going to be long-lived in everyone. Another question that uh, came in is, well, this virus uh, just made the jump to humans uh, a few months ago. Uh, what is the possibility for continued uh, viral evolution to uh, become either more virulent or change its flavor in other ways? And do we have evidence uh, at present that, for example, is the New, is the New York virus more virulent than uh, the virus in Wuhan? Well, I think fortunately there's no evidence for sort of changes in virulence that have, you know, sort of really got legs. Um, but, you know, we are seeing variation in this virus as it, you know, spreads around the globe. And um, there are sort of variations sort of in the, uh, in the spike protein that are associated with an enhanced ability apparently to spread. Um, so we've seen instances of uh, viruses with that sort of variation actually sort of spreading in the population much more effectively than the sort of parental virus that doesn't have that mutation. Fortunately, I think there's no evidence so far that, um, you know, the virus is, is, um, is more virulent. And in fact, I, I don't think, I think that's, I, I mean, if you, if you sort of put yourself in the virus mentality uh, here, uh, this virus is pretty good at what it does. 
Um, you know, it, it replicates to very high levels, uh, you know, sort of mild symptoms in most people. It's, you know, you're, you're potentially sort of spewing out lots of virus. Um, so it, I, I don't think there would be a strong selection um, for a virus that, that has, has that kind of, you know, sort of natural history to, to sort of evolve to or be selected to be more virulent. Um, Unless, right. unless it was linked to spread efficiency or something. Do you have uh, any speculation as to why children don't seem to get uh, the same type of disease, at least uh, the same respiratory disease that uh, older adults do? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I do think, you know, there are sort of differences in the sort of biology of children and adults. <laughs> um, but, you know, there, there are sort of prudential differences in, in terms of, and this has come up, I think, when people have talked about, well, is there any evidence for cross-reactive antibody responses or sort of T-cell responses that could be elicited uh, sort of by these common cold viruses that might, you know, sort of influence the course of SARS-CoV-2 uh, sort of infection and, and pathogenesis. So, you know, that's one thing that, um, in the early days when people were discussing this, they thought, ah, well, you know, these things are so far apart, you know, there's really sort of, it's unlikely that there's going to be, you know, sort of, uh, you know, cross-reactive uh, portions. And uh, really, there, there are some new studies coming out now that show that there are both antibodies and cellular responses in SARS-CoV-2 unexposed people that uh, sort of can recognize uh, you know, parts of SARS-CoV-2. So if kids that have been getting bombarded with these cold viruses are, you know, building up, you know, a, a more sort of robust um, sort of immunity, and some of that is, is uh, sort of cross-protective, or at least in terms of ameliorating disease, that could explain it. But I think there, I think that's probably only part of the, uh, part of the story, if, if it's a story at all. I think there's enough enthusiasm now that people will dig deeper there and actually figure that out. So there's been a lot of enthusiasm for trying to uh, repurpose drugs that have already been in humans uh, for other purposes uh, to use for uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, obviously remdesivir is uh, one example of such a drug. Are there others that uh, you hold out uh, promise for or are we gonna have to rely on developing entirely new chemical entities? Um. You know, I think there are a lot of them that are, you know, sort of being tested now. Uh, as you well know, there are sort of a myriad of, of clinical studies going on for just about any drug that is, you can imagine, that might have an impact, some of which, you know, sort of have an effect on, on uh, you know, sort of virus replication in cell culture, some which don't. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I, I really think that we, you know, maybe some of these, these, these compounds would have the ability to sort of, you know, allow people to get out of the hospital sooner, you know, sort of as we're seeing with sort of the remdesivir. But um, I'm not sure that any of them are going to, to have anything like the sort of, you know, sort of laser sharp uh, sort of antiviral efficacy that sort of the drugs have that you, you know, when, when you really sort of go after, you know, the virus and, and do it the, the classic way. Um, so, you know, I hope that some of them have some activity and, you know, sort of get us out of this dark period uh, or help, help, you know, sort of cut down on the number of people that die. But I don't think it's going to be anything magical. Um, and, and part of the reason, too, is really, as you, as you brought out, it is timing. Um, you know, it is likely that, you know, these drugs are going to be less efficacious um, when people are, you know, showing more severe symptoms of disease. Great. Well, we could go on forever. And as you can tell, Charlie and I uh, are inclined to do just that. But I think uh, in the interest of time, we should bring our discussion to a close now. Once again, I want to thank Charlie for a terrific overview of his work and a really brilliant discussion. Uh, as you've heard, uh, he's made remarkable strides in a very short period of time, but there's still a lot that lies ahead of us. Uh, 
I would like to take the opportunity to remind you that philanthropic support is, in, is vital to uh, this effort. And on the next, you can see more information about how you might contribute and help at the, the COVID-19 pandemic. In closing, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you'll visit our website where we'll, we will be posting information about future webinars and where you can find a recording of our past sessions. All of us here at Rockefeller hope that you will stay safe and be healthy. Thank you very much for participating this afternoon. Good evening.